Welcome all to this online talk on the occasion of our exhibition, A Comp Maker's Tale, which is currently on display at Z33. So my name is Dries Verbrugge, together with my partner Claire Warnier, we founded Unfold in 2002. We're a design studio and most of our work is rooted in this interest in the history of making from craftsmanship over the industrial era and how these narratives project into the future where they intersect with new, mostly digital technologies. We do client-based projects, but most people will probably know us from our large body of autonomous projects, um, which are often self-initiated or by the invitation of musea, galleries and biennials. These range from limited edition objects over speculative scenarios to multi-year collaborative research projects like uh, Atlas of Lost Finds, uh, where we're working on at the moment, where we're looking at rematerializing lost artifacts from digital data in collaboration with uh, Brazil's Fire Ravaged National Museum. So a lot of our work is about investigating material culture in a digital era. And I think that's a very good description also of where a comp maker still fits in. A comp maker still was commissioned by um, Made in Platform and Made in Platform is a collaboration between various initiatives, organizations um, grouped under the Made in Platform. And we were invited by Made in Zagreb to do a collaboration as, as a design studio with one of the many artisanal makers that still uh, work in the, in the Zagreb region. And at first we were a little bit skeptical because we don't really um, believe or we, we don't really feel attracted to this idea of, of a designer almost in a patriarchic way coming to collaborate with a, with a craftsman, of craftswoman and to kind of bring in design to solve uh, craft or to um, to open up a new economical model or something like that. But we were really happy that um, the Made In platform was, was not really interested in those type of collaborations, but more into more deeper investigative narratives. And, but we collaborated with a, with a artisanal maker, but not in the sense that we made an object together. Um, and we were really drawn to the story of Anton Penecic. Uh, Anton is 82 years old and he's the last living comb maker in Croatia and one of the last comb makers in, in Europe um, overall. And so he makes uh, combs and, and other objects from a cattle horn. So here's, for example, one of these horns. So it's a natural material and he has done this a large portion of his life and in the last 10 years he tried to find an apprentice and he hasn't been able to find anyone who wanted to learn the craft from him and he was even offering all his tools for free and and to really go through all the steps of the process and to to learn this as a master to an apprentice so we were really intrigued by this question, why do we value handmade objects, but not the manual effort involved? Why is nobody really willing to do the work? And this fits into this, I think, renewed interest in craft, in handmade objects versus anonymous industrial production. But at the same time, like I mentioned, nobody seems to be interested to actually do the hard work. And so we decided we wanted to make a film and the film is in part a documentary and in part a poetic speculative uh, project. And with the film, we really wanted to challenge humankind's motive. I'll briefly show a few uh, key fragments that, that take you through the, the film, but to see the whole 10 minute film, of course, you have to come to Z33. In the first quarter of the film, we're introduced to Anton's life story, which is narrated by him and his wife, Mara.
We see how Anton works in his tiny workshop. In other scenes, we are slowly wandering through his studio without him actually being there. And it is at this point that we introduce the robot tool in a shot that is quite reminiscent of a sci-fi movie. Is it dystopian? Is it slightly intimidating? But we quickly discover that those slow wandering shots were actually filmed through the eye of the robot who's exploring the workshop with a youth-like curiosity. The robot explores the various tools that are in the studio just by touching them, by playing with them. And he gets to work. And in the beginning, that's of course, like every apprentice, not always with success. And you see him trying to master simple actions like screwing, driving in a screw. And this is something where we touch on something called Mor Moravec's paradox. And that's a paradox in computing and in robotics. And it says that what's easy for a human, like turning a screw, is hard for a robot and the other way around. A computer is really, for a computer, it's really easy to calculate a million decimals of pi, which is, of course, very difficult for a human. And we discovered that while Anton needs a specialized tool, the robot is actually the tool itself. And at the end, our robot apprentice starts to become a true master. And this is the last shot of the film, and it's the one that many robot specialists always have to laugh about. A robot that turns off the light he doesn't even need. And But for us, it's kind of this poetic action where the robot is really trying to follow in the footsteps of Anton and uh, replicating what he learned from his master. Um, so the film was produced in collaboration with uh, Alexandre Humbert, who is specialized in using film as a medium within uh, his design practice. And one of his projects uh, is called Object Interview, and it shows objects as very animistic creatures that have a life on their own with typical human characteristics. And they're narrating their own uh, being, their own story. So for us, it was very kind of seeing these short films that he made where he really breathes life in an inanimate object. And for us, it was really important that in this film, that the robot itself also became one of the narrators of the story and that we really started also to, um, to feel empathy with the robot. So for us, it was really seeing uh, the way that Alexandre is, is able to, to take objects and to create really poetic narratives with, with almost static objects uh, was very powerful and was for us a, a trigger to, to ask him to collaborate on this project. Um, one of the things we, we developed together also is, um, is a way of using the robot also as, as a filmmaking tool. So it was important that part of the, of the film was actually shot through the perspective of the robot. And there's uh, a couple of these long, long traveling shots, which are, which feel a little bit inhuman or they feel a, there's a little bit friction in them because you feel that's not a natural um, motion that a human would make. So it's really by using the robot, we also create this kind of idea that the film is through the eyes of the robot, um, through the perspective of the robot itself, who is trying to observe and trying to learn um, from, from uh, Master Anton. The exhibition itself is comprised of a few parts. 
um, one uh, the, the biggest part or the main part is a replica of Anton's shit. So we build a small shed that is exactly the size of Anton's shed in his uh, backyard in Zagreb. Uh, so you get a bit an, an intimate feeling with with the size of his literally his universe. Um, and in the shed we play the film. So there's only a small uh, group that can can view the film um, at the same time. In the other room at Z33, we present uh, about 50 comps and we leave it to the spectator to wonder who made the comps, um, whether they're from Antun, the robots, or a collaboration. And also in this space, we show um, three interviews. First, it was really important to have besides this um, poetic film, this poetic document that really is there to not um, find answers, but to raise a lot of questions, um, to contextualize this film. And to do that, we interviewed four specialists um, on domes from the university in Brussels, from the research group of digital mathematics. She specialized in how computers and computer algorithms look at uh, art, for example, and how artificial intelligence can replicate also uh, art or the, um, the tool marks of a painter, for example. There's uh, Bram van der Burgt. He is professor in the Human Robotics Research Center, specialized in uh, human robotic interaction. There's Garrett Neal, who is a designer and maker. He's a really skillful uh, woodworker, but at the same time also employs a lot of digital tools like CNC mills and 3D printers in his practice. And there is um, Tanya Herod, very inspiring uh, craft historian. So she was reflecting on the film from a craft and industrial history perspective. Um, and so we cut up these interviews into three different films that talk about the different kind of angles uh, that are in the film from the, the craft side, the robotic side, or whether you should actually um, preserve a craft. And I think that that question, should a robot save an age old craft? If a human doesn't want to, if we as humans uh, don't want to preserve a craft, should we use a robot or should we use technology? And I think Tanya Harrod gave really an interesting kind of um, answer to it. And she said that I think the idea of craft preserved in vinegar is a widespread kind of illusion. Craft has always adapted. At one point, everything was craft. Everything that was made was not made in an industrial situation. And craft had to adapt, adapt or die. And I think that's something that over the last 10 years, we have been um, exploring a lot in, in our projects and in our work. So I want to briefly go through a couple of, of projects to, um, to show actually where uh, a comp maker still also fits in a large series, in a large body of work that we've produced over the last 10 years that are investigating this kind of intersection between craft, technology, and design. The first to start with is L'Artisan Electronique, which was actually saw the, the day of light, so to speak. Uh, also at Z33 in Hasselt, it was a commission for um, design by performance in 2010, it was a collaboration with Tim Knappen. Um, in L'Artisan Electronique, from first sight, it's kind of a 21st century take on a traditional pottery studio. On one side of the in installation, there was a digital pottery wheel. So visitors to the gallery, when they approached the installation, there was a screen with a rotating cylinder. Once you move your hand in front of the screen, uh, you cross a laser beam and the profile that the beam projects on your hand is copied on the screen. And you can literally push your hand in the digital matter and start uh, shaping an object, start forming an object. On the other side of the installation, there was uh, a tool that we started developing uh, a year earlier in 2009, which is a 3D printer for uh, ceramics. So all the objects that people made in the gallery uh, true on the digital pottery wheel were saved in a database. And we would then come into the gallery and explore that database, select objects, which we would then print out or materialize on, on the 3D printer in clay, 
and after firing and glazing those objects, they were also displayed in, in the gallery. And for us, these installations are very narrative uh, storytellers. And they kind of visualize a lot of the, or they question a lot of the things that we are interested in and that we're developing here in the studio. So they raise a lot of these questions and it's up to the visitor to also formulate um, their own kind of answers and positions in there. And we observed that one of the um, critiques that we often um, got was from a craft perspective that people reacted to it and said like, ah, why do you make something that is perfectly tactile and age old craft and you turn it into a, some kind of computer, computer game. And at first glance, this project might seem like a reductive approach of wheel throwing um, bringing this illustrious craft that has evolved over millennia of human development to the level of a four-button guitar hero. But for us, it was we came really from this other side. We were much more frustrated by contemporary uh, computer interfaces. And when you're designing or, or making something on a computer in a CAD program, in a digital design program, the interface of doing that is not that different from the interface of your email or for example facebook you're clicking menus you're dragging windows you're typing commands so there's very limited connection between uh, what the hand does and what the result is uh, in the object so that kind of relation between the hand and the, and the making is really um, uh, broken and is disconnected so we were really interested in how can we make the digital matter kind of dirty again, kind of hands-on again, and also remove as much as the interaction with the digital medium, take it away from the screen and from this, um, this uh, secondary interfaces and make them very hands-on and tangible again. So for us, connecting back to, to Tanya Harrod's uh, answer about uh, craft, that it is something that is very much alive. And we've taken this quote from Abstracting Craft from Malcolm McCullough, really interesting book um, that tries to abstract craft, to stretch the definition of craft, to find a place for digital tools, that craft is not about a design or an individual artifact or, an, or a specific technique, but it's about the tradition of production, the tradition of making, the presence of many different objects identical in their concept, but very unique in their individual execution. So craft is, is about working on a personal scale and acting locally in reaction to anonymous globalized production. And what interests us is that um, with digital tools, we see that uh, the scale of what used to be really expensive and complex industrial tools is, is shrinking and it's becoming the size of the individual maker's uh, studio again. So we see that 3D printers, but now also these robotic arms become so uh, affordable and, and really human scale that you can start uh, employing them in, in an individual a craft context or in a designer maker context. And that's also why we were really interested in using this robot arm from Franca Imka, who uh, supported us with this project, is that it's a new generation of robots that is really intended to collaborate with people and not to replace humans. So this generations of robots actually senses um, touch, senses um, when they are being touched by a human or when they collide with somebody who is working nearby. And what that opens up for us as possibility is that, for example, traditional um, autonomous, uh, automated manufacturing tools, in a way, they have no sense. They don't feel a material and they will just blow through a material like a CNC mill uh, will blow through a material. And when you look at Anton Scombs, and you can see it in the exhibition, they're all curved, they're all bent because the source material is always slightly bent and slightly different. And Antun anticipates in his making and really fits his comb um, to make um, use of that uh, curvature in the comb. And this is something we're probably going to explore in future projects, um, how we can actually have that sense of a material that is so typical for a craft maker versus uh, a machine 
that they always look and, and have real-time feedback on the material they have in hand while working on it. And that's why the output is also always different. Um, and so that's really the way I think we often work is where one project often is the starting point of also new type of research, new kinds of, of research and collaborations.